I'm going to do a combination of uh, slideshows and uh, video of uh, of Halloween introduction to Halloween. I would say I would call it. Um, this last time I did this with the uh, how to make a sphere last summer, I used a uh, my old camcorder, and the resolution on the camcorder was not uh, that special. So this time I used my phone and it is a much higher resolution image. So I'm happy with that. However, I did not do not have my son to be a cameraman for me. So I was doing a jury rig thing where I had two, two of my, my older phone and my new phone hooked up to tripods. I was trying to make it work. And, um, let me just say, I'm not going to, uh, choose cameraman as my main profession going forward. So I apologize a little bit for some of the, some of the images, but, uh, besides that, I think, uh, Hopefully you'll learn something. So I'm um, going to start with a little bit of video. And um, first uh, topic I'm going to cover is uh, tools. First, I'm going to just start with um, uh, the craft supplies catalog. Show you there's a no large number of tools, large number. Uh, there's many, many people who make them, and they're all roughly the same in quality. I just want to mention a few things that I use. This is the um, the Stewart system. Uh, Dennis Stewart, um, he, he developed that many years ago, 20, 30 years ago. He, I don't think he's in business anymore, but he sold the rights to the system to um, uh, to Sorby. So remarkets it. But but Sorby is one of the few that um, uh, has this arm brace here. So. Um, uh, I personally think that that's a great addition and I, um, I find it very comfortable to use. And uh, even if you, and here he has two uh, boring bars that fit into the handle here and there's a straight bar and a, um, and a gooseneck bar. And I'll talk more about those in a minute. There are many other um, types of um, tools. These are the Jaskowski tools. I don't use them, but I do use the Kelton hollowers. These are smaller. Uh, half inch diameter. Uh, for most of the bigger hollow forms, I use three quarter inch diameter shafts. These are half inch for smaller pieces. Um, I have all three, the set of all three of these. You can see the price is very um, reasonable. Um, and these uh, I find very, I, these are, I use these all the time. I want to mention one other um, set before I leave this page, and that is the um, Sorby, uh, he calls them the multi-tip hollowing tools. Uh, the thing about these are, is they're round on one side and the other side they're flat. And the flats, and you can use it either way. And I do use it both ways. I only have the straight one. And in fact, I don't have a Sorby because I, I, I'm not quite uh, enamored with the tool holder that he that is used here to hold the little tips. But I have a homemade version that I like and I use. Uh, I used to use a lot and now I just use it on occasion. All right, so anyways, uh, and there's many other tool suppliers. There's uh, Trent Bosch and John Jordan, both sell some very nice tools. Packard Woodward uh, has, uh, carries uh, Dave Hout's tools. Dave Hout, former, uh, pretty much founder, founding member of this club back in the 80s. He, he makes tools for, um, and he has some boring bar tools that are, that are quite uh, reasonable in price. They look good, so, and he sells them through Packard. Um, and there's others too. Todd Rains, uh, he has his own wood turning st store and he has some uh, reasonably priced tools also. Okay, so I'm going to start. Here's my standard key um, um, boring bar. You see it has a three quarter inch shaft and a very long handle so that you can hold it underneath your arm when you're using it. And you move and you use it by twisting your body. Um, you're resting the piece on the tool rest and you're twisting your body as you move it in and out of the, out of the piece. Now, again, a three quarter inch bar allows you to hang it way over the tool rest without vibration. And, and so uh, uh, that is, um, um, I'll get back to the, how far over the bar you can take it. But anyways, but I use these straight boring bars so much, I end up having two, um, two bars, one with a three sixteenth inch cutter which is uh, the homemade one, and one that's based on the, on the uh, Stewart system. And I use a quarter inch um, cutter in there just so that they're, um, just because I use them so much and I like to have that variety. 
Okay. Now you see that the the um, the both of the bars are three quarter inch diameter. The homemade one, which is mine, is just a just a steel rod with a hole drilled in the end and some holes tapped for the um, for the set screws. Um, the, the professionally made one has a little bit of a taper at the tip, and that makes it a little bit better for clearance. But anyways, here's how the handle works, the Stewart handle, I call it, or the Sorby handle. And again, it'll, it, it's very ergonomically uh, straightforward, and I, I really think it's a good, uh, good way to go. There's only one other person I know who makes such an such a armrest, and that's John Jordan. And his looks quite a bit different. And, and since I have this one, I have never tried his, but it's, he, I'm sure he... Um, He's designed his to be useful. All right, and then that same Stewart system has a, a, a what I call a gooseneck bar or a swan neck bar uh, that fits in the same holder. And um, the the thing you have to remember is that this is used, the gooseneck bars are used to um, get around the shoulders to hollow out the shoulders, but you cannot have the curved part on the tool rest when you're using it because it it it'll it, won't work. You have to have the straight part on the tool rest. So it'll it'll flip down like that if you have it there, but instead you have to have the tool rest uh, over the straight part of the bar. So those are the main ones that I use for hand hollowing without a rig, without a jig. Um, this one here is the Jameson bar. These are all about 50 bucks, 60, 70 dollars, depending on which kind you get. The Jameson one is double ended. And it, he, he sells it with these swivel tips and you can put it in either end at a different, uh, different uh, uh, location so that you can, again, uh, use it for different geometries of bowls. You could use that handheld, but really the straight bar like that, if you're hanging off, the, if you have it in the angle position, you better be um, um, using a jig really. So these are the Kelton hollowers. You can see they're much, uh, not much, but significantly daintier. Uh, these are half inch uh, rods, but I use these for small, smaller hollow forms. And I use these both in the, in the Jameson rig that I own and also by hand. And you see the handle is a little bit smaller. Um, those, those are Doug Thompson uh, tool holders there, the blue uh, tip. Um, and one other uh, half inch diameter, um, Hollowing tool that I use, it's called a, it's the woodcut tool. Woodcut is a um, Australian or New Zealand, I forgot. Anyways, it's a hook tool, and that brass piece on top um, is it's called a, a limiter, or, or it, it limit you adjust it such that only a tiny gap exists between the cutter, which is on the bottom, and the brass cap on the top. It produces you you create a, a tiny gap, like uh, less than a sixteenth of an inch or so. And uh, that allows you to, um, it, it controls the cut so you don't get catches. This is excellent for end grain hollowing. And but I use it more for end grain boxes and end grain jars than I do for hollowing. It does swivel, um, which, uh, and, and you can find YouTube videos of the guy using this to hollow out. And, um, but again, I, I haven't, uh, I just haven't decided, uh, practice enough to use it, but you could swivel it around and you could also add an extra link so you can create it more like a gooseneck shape to make it work. But again, these things cut great um, on end grain, end grain only. So those are my half inch diameter tools. Um, for very small uh, hollow forms, you can use quarter inch. And I do have some of those. Um, there's a uh, straight, uh, a, a square shaft, quarter inch uh, square with a, with a piece on the side that's, a, I think that's like a Bob Rosan design. And then the straight uh, cutter also goes in that <laughs> same piece. That um, gooseneck shape also could work with the half inch diameter, but I, I have, I bought that, but I've never used it yet. Um, these are my carbide tools. These are, um, the, the orange one is a easy wood tool and the, the, the one with the round cutter is a homemade version of that. I used to use those a lot when I was first hollowing. I rarely use them now. I only use them on occasion. I'd probably sell those if someone wanted them. And this is another homemade tool. Again, it's a knockoff of the Sorby. It's round on one side 
and it's uh, flat on the other. And I put in a carbide cutter in there, a quarter inch carbide cutter that can swivel. And I used to use that a lot before I, I, I got the Jameson rig. Again, you could do any, almost any hollow form you want. There's a, there's a quarter inch shaft with a, a carbide cutter. I, again, I, these are some of the tools I, I used to use and I don't use them anymore that much. And I also had a friend of mine bend some steel so I could make a gooseneck version with a carbide cutter. And I've never actually used that, but um, yeah. So anyways, um, you could, again, you can do any type of um, um, hollow forms by hand or almost any. And, but the, the jigs, the hollowing jigs, rigs are, are a little bit easier on your body. I wanna stop here. Also, I wanna mention something that very few, you're lucky, very few people have seen what you've seen so far, and the, including my wife, and that is um, a very clean shop. I have absolutely no shavings in this shop right now. And that probably, well, since I made this tape, it's not been looking this nice again since then. All right, here's a close up of great, the- Great, Mike. Uh, yeah. Um, here's a close up of the cutters. Again, these are high speed steel. You can get this anywhere from uh, uh, Packard Woodworking to Harbor Freight to um, Enco or Master, McMaster Car. And um, you see, I have three sizes there, the one eighth, the three sixteenths and the one quarter. You could actually, my boring bar has a big enough um, hole that it would take a half inch or a three eighths inch bar cutter too. But those are usually too big. That would be used maybe uh, I've actually, I've only used that once for a specialized situation. So in addition to, and these, uh, the longer pieces fit into the end of the, of the, of the hole, you can see, and it's held with set screws. Um, now the John Jordan, uh, tool that he sells, um, he also is, uh, uses set screws to hold the piece hold the cutter in there. And I, I uh, like the set screw method. You'd unscrew, unscrew it. Every now and then it loosens up due to vibration, but you take you can take it out of the holder and um, sharpen it a little bit more conveniently. The Trent Bosch version, he, um, he has his glued into the shaft with a super glue, CA glue. And um, he sharpens the tool freehand uh, or sharpens the bit freehand um, without taking it out of the shaft. And you, you, it's something, it's an acquired uh, task. I, I guess I don't prefer to do that. If you, and you can break the CA glue uh, bond relatively easy with a torch. If you give it a five seconds of, of heating and it'll break. And then you could remove it to replace it or sharpen it. But basically those are your choices. Now I'm holding here the uh, Jameson swivel tip. You can get these swivel tips from more than one place. Um, but again, it's the same cutter in the straight bar as in uh, this, this piece here is 3 16th. That's the same one that's in the Jameson rig there. Um, again, back in, the, uh, in my early days, I used this straight shaft um, again, it has a swivel tip there just to, uh, to hold the carbide cutter. Flat on the tool rest is a little bit easier for resisting torque. Here's another one, another a boring bar that I picked up somewhere. And um, I have a swivel tip in that, and that works the same. It's got a flat, um, flat bottom for helping stabilize it. But in some cases, you prefer the round. I prefer the round shape, and I flip it up upside down and reattach it. Now, if you, um, I'm gonna talk about torque. Um, let me draw that here. So again, if this is the lathe axis this way, so the, uh, the P, let's say the chuck is here and um, your piece is, is in, the, in the chuck. This, um, if, when, I, when I talk about torque, okay, it's, it's, and this is the tool rest and your tool is, is uh, uh, hollowing like this, um, the farther off the lathe axis you are, so the more like this you are, and the more like this, um, the more torque is on the piece. It's more likely to vibrate. It's more likely to knock you or knock uh, catch, or, or it's harder to keep the tool steady. And that's why 
you use these, these swan neck bars. The swan neck, again, looks like this, and then it curves like, well, let me clear off this stuff first. How do I do that? All right, so a swan neck bar, if this is a straight bar, a swan neck bar comes out like this and then it comes back so that the cutting tip is roughly in the same axis as, the, as your main bar. And when you, and this allows you to, uh, to get around the corner without increasing torque. And so you'll see an example like this here, um, that, um, uh, that would be very low torque, but the Jameson system where he just swivels the tip, tip over without adding the, the gooseneck is a little bit more prone to uh, vibration in my opinion. That's why you, it's better to use a Jake with his. Okay. That's a one eighth inch cutter. I haven't used that much. That would be for small things like Christmas ornaments. Here's one specialty piece. I got this in a, in a box for, uh, at one of the auctions. Um, never used it, but some of this guy, Jens Bingle, who donated a bunch of stuff to our auction, um, he had sharpened that to his, for a special, uh, special uh, chore, I guess. All right. So this piece here, um, again, if you tilt that, swivel that piece over, um, you will start to induce torque, but I designed and, and built these um, little linkages that would allow me to uh, create my own flexible uh, shaped bar. And you can make a, you could approximate a gooseneck by using something like that. But uh, I designed these and had these made for me by a machinist, but I've never used them. So I don't know what to say about that. There's again, the Jameson bar. You stick that piece in there. That's for most cutting you would uh, have the swivel tip almost straight and then gradually move it over to get more stuff out. To get around a shoulder, you use the curved tool holder like this. And to get even farther across the shoulder, you switch it around and you would uh, insert it at a 45 degree angle. And um, I'll show you how that works in a second. To get anything where the diameter of your piece is much, much bigger than the, much larger than the length, like a, what I would call a flying saucer shape, um, those, those, uh, that bar is probably the best one for that. Okay, so here I'm holding a, um, a hollow form that's been roughed out. You see when you, uh, a three quarter inch bar is a little bit on this large size for, for this smaller thing, but you can see a straight, straight at, uh, shafted bar can get 80% of the hollowing. You just can't get the shoulder. And that's why you need a, a curved bar to get around and get into that corner. And you can't really see it th that great in this, with this example of a finished piece, but I'll show you next on that broken one there. See this piece here, um, I was almost, again, looks like I was almost 80% complete with the hollowing and the thing broke into two pieces. I got a catch. You can see how the curved, swan neck can get it, get around the corner much better. However, the three quarter inch shaft for that such a small entry hole, isn't that great. You see there's very, very little, little clearance between the, uh, the, the OD of the shaft and the ID of the entry hole. So uh, really for such a smaller piece, the, the Kelton hollower uh, bars are the better choice. You see the smaller shaft there, it's much easier to get in and clean out the, um, clean out the, the, the uh, inside. Now I'm pointing out here, um, if you look right here, the wall is thinnest right about here, a little bit thicker here, and then it's thick again here. Um, what happened, I think, was I was trying to clean up this area here and get it smooth all the way down from here to here before I started uh, finishing up and I got a catch and the thing broke. And I think I got a catch. It happens in the, like a half of a second or something. It's very quick. But I think I had the uh, gooseneck bar. I had the larger gooseneck bar, which means that I didn't have a lot of clearance here. And um, I was probably did not have the tool rest in the proper position. I probably had the tool rest in the curved part 
rather than on the straight part. And that those two things combined to cause me to, uh, to have this piece fail. Um, so basically, but at this point, if you were looking, if I was, if I was, uh, didn't have this failure, I would have proceeded to get rid of this uh, bump in the inside. Then I would get rid of this bump here to get it smooth all the way. And then get, you can, might see some tool marks here like this. I would try to smooth those out, especially as far as your finger can stick in and, and you want it to feel smooth for that part. After I re um, um, finished um, hollowing down to here, then I would finish hollowing the bottom part out here like this, something like that. So anyways, um, I probably, covering that here, but um, so you leave the, the, the bottom thick um, for, for more uh, so the piece stays stiffer and it doesn't vibrate as much. Okay, now the, uh, also I wanna point out that the teardrop cutter there is relatively large. And I do have, a, uh, it's called, a, it's a scraper bit that goes in there. And that's not usually used for hollowing out. It's used more for smoothing out the inside that this, um, this shaped cutter here. But there's a smaller one I have that allows a little bit more dexterity for getting into, or flexibility for getting into uh, uh, smaller pieces. So, and the same cutter can use on both. If I had to do, if I had to add one more tool, again, I have plenty of tools here, but if I had to add one more, I would get a, a, uh, a smaller diameter shaft. Okay, before I go on, this is a uh, carbide cutter. This is offered, this is a hunter carbide. Those other ones I showed you were just plain garden variety, uh, flat carbide cutters that are, are uh, straight, and they're definitely scrapers, but the hutter is again, it's got a cup shape and it's much more like a, uh, a cutting bit rather than as a scraping bit. And Jameson offers this in this holder and he uses this all the time. I'm really not that good at using it and I haven't used it as much. I only tend to use it on very hard woods, um, but basically it's, it's inserted into that holder at a 30 degree angle. that fits into the swivel tip. Okay. One other thing I wanna to talk to about is sharpening these, these uh, high-speed steel bits. You can see here, um, the one on the left, or the one on the right is almost like an 85 degree bevel, and the one on the left is more like 65 or 70. I usually use about 70, uh, the same uh, 75, the same angle on my standard conventional scrapers. Um, but it's really not that critical. It's more important to get, establish a nice burr on top rather than the, the cut. But the one with the 85 degree um, bevel, that would cause a little bit of issues with, the, um, uh, with clearance sometimes. Would, the heel of the, of the piece would probably rub on the wood if you're not careful. Okay, so I'm leaving cutters now. And the other essential tools, uh, the second most important tool besides the cutters are uh, ways of measuring wall thickness. And the... the Old fashioned way is the using uh, calipers. You can see the standard calipers, not that easy to use. Um, um, so in I tend not to use that type. Instead I use the, what I call the David Ellsworth calipers. He describes these in his book, but basically it's just a piece of copper wire, copper rod, and um, uh, you can fit it in and fit it uh, in various places along the length. And depending on the position in the bar, you'd switch it over and use different sides. Okay, so the key to using these is that there's a gap. There's a, a gap between the um, one uh, end of the uh, caliper and the other. And so this gap is the way I have it now, it's roughly uh, three quarters of an inch wide. And so the wood and the air, I'm sorry, when you're looking at these, you observe the, the air gap here, which is, let's say a half of an inch. That means that the wall thickness is a quarter of an inch by subtraction. So you use these in that, in that manner. 
Now, the other thing is you have to measure perpendicular to the wall. Okay, so examples here, this piece here, and this piece here, you draw the connection, it's roughly uh, perpendicular to the wall. If you did it, if you had you arranged it such that they were not perpendicular like that, you would get an in, inaccurate reading. It would be, you would be reading very large thickness when in fact you're relatively small. So that's why you need this, this uh, flexible uh, geometry. And in fact, you have to flip it around to get to different parts of the, uh, uh, parts of this piece. So right there, again, you can, uh, you can see the air gap and uh, the remaining by subtraction, you know how thick the wood is. As you go down, you can't get right there. It's not perpendicular. So you'd be getting the wrong answer. Um, and then you'd have to flip it over uh, and use the other end of the, uh, of the uh, caliper. Like that. Now I have a couple of these that I, I almost like a standardized shape. You see them here, they're both almost the same. They're like D-shaped, but in certain, certain pieces I need to, um, I just have these extra pieces laying around that I bend to the way I'd like to for each individual piece. Now on other tools besides uh, here, uh, okay, let me talk about this first. So this is a, um, talking about getting around the, this is a flying saucer shape. It's very wide. It's about ten, eight, nine inches di diameter and only two or three inches deep. To get around that corner is very challenging. And so you, the Jameson bar is excellent for that. So um, um, you see in the beginning, you can get in so, so, so far just using the straight shaft and the straight holder. After a while then, you have to switch to this uh, the curved holder to get farther over across the shoulder. Also, this piece is even tougher to do because of um, it's a very flat top. It's not a sloped top. So that again, uh, makes it more difficult. But to get to the farthest reaches of this piece, you have to use the, you have to switch over to the 45 degree angle and you uh, insert it there. And um, in fact, I did achieve getting out to the farthest uh, parts of the diameter with, with this uh, arrangement. Now look at this piece here and you can see that you're hanging over the, I was talking about inducing uh, torque, okay? So um, you're way over, uh, um, this distance is maybe three inches, two or three inches um, off of the center axis. So the torque is significant. That's why the, Jam you know, so Jameson system, which uh, re uh, relies on a backrest which uh, prevents the, 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 the tool from tipping over. And it works quite well for that. However, it does not necessarily prevent vibration. And the vibration in this condition is a little, is a little bit uh, excessive. And you have to live with that. If you wanna make a flying saucer, you're gonna to have to live with that type of vibration. Now maybe uh, some of these other bent tools um, can achieve a similar depth, but I have, I don't, they're not in my inventory. I have gooseneck tools, but I that but don't quite get this far out off the axis. Okay. So again, you see how th thin this piece is. Not thin, short. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other tool you need besides uh, measuring devices is a uh, is a light. That piece was a. Um, uh, a gooseneck um, or a flexible and LED light that I don't use anymore because I, uh, the batteries go bad on it all the time. And it has a click on it or a, an on off switch. It's either on or off. And I tended to always leave it on and I forget to turn it off and the batteries would go dead. That little green one is a, something I bought at Mark's. It works fine. Um, I noticed that Packard has an excellent looking one. It's a Dave Hout, um, uh, flex, flexible shafts, uh, battery operated uh, um, light, but it does. It has a different kind of switch where you could just want, you press the button down for light and you release uh, your your thumb on, and it turns off automatically. And I probably should have bought that. But this one here, this is a Cindy Drozda light, and it doesn't require batteries at all. So you can see it has a uh, electric cord. 
It's got two or th a small number of lights there on one side and a magnet on the other side. And sometimes I just stick it in there or I attach it to my boring bar sometimes, or I, in this case, I have an old file and I just uh, attach it to that to, for sticking in. Turn it on and it works quite well. I'm very impressed with this light. It's quite nice. It's about $30, $40. But the one, the Dave Hout one is uh, uh, also quite, uh, quite same price and quite useful. The other thing you have to do is every, you have to stop uh, turning every minute or so to get rid of the shavings. And again, I show the air hose to knock the, the uh, blast the shavings out, but I also use different types of scoops to get in there. These happen to be, um, uh, plastic spoons and a, and a homemade uh, little hoe I made out of with a piece of wood and a flexible copper pipe. Those plastic spoons are from Dairy Queen and um, I, you can heat them with a heating gun and um, shape them to way you, the way you want. So if, if you uh, feel like um, whenever you eat a, a Dairy Queen blizzard, save the spoons. Okay, any questions about tools at this time before I go to the next topic? Yeah, Mike, have you used any of the um, digital calipers for, for like how accurate or close do you get in your wall thicknesses or uniformity in your wall thicknesses, which is... <laughs> you know, I don't feel the need to get that close. I think with... Um, once I get to a certain thickness quarter inch or three sixteenths. I stop really measuring and then I just go for smoothness. I'm like constantly going, uh, doing very, very light scraping cuts to get very smooth walls with no bumps. And to me, that's more important than ultimate thickness. The only time you really need to control your thickness really accuracy and my, really accurately, in my opinion, is if you're going to do piercing. Then you got to be pretty close to being one eighth inch or less. And it's, uh, it's something I haven't ever done. So um, anyways, I'm gonna to switch to some slides for a few minutes. Um, I wanna talk a few things about how to hollow. I wanna first mention that um, some shapes are easier to hollow than others. Um, let's see. So these ones on the right, this one is difficult because it's a very flat top, uh, almost square. You have to get around the corner. That's not too, uh, that's not trivial. This one is even more difficult. It is a flying saucer shape, as I call it. The height is maybe three or four inches. The, um, the diameter is maybe 10 inches. And the entry hole is on the small side. So this one would be very challenging. It's not something you want to start with. This one here is the easiest one. You could do this entire hollowing with a single tool, a single straight shaft. You can see this very gentle slope here allows you to get all the way down. You don't have to go around any corners, really. By the time you're down this far, the straight shaft works fine, whether you're here or here or straight. So this is the easiest one. This one here, these two um, are easy because the holes are relatively large, okay? You do have to get around the corners or the shoulders, but the, beside, because the holes are large, um, they're not um, especially difficult. And as, as you learn how to hollow, you would start with this, and go to something like these two, and then maybe go to something like this. But this one is uh, somewhat of a uh, uh, difficult shape because the diameter is bigger than the height, but it's, it's uh, still, uh, the real reason this one is easy is because the hole was quite large for uh, hollowing, and then the guy put a, uh, a insert on to, um, uh, to cover up the hole. So it's a nice technique to use to, to uh, disguise how you were working. And a lot of these uh, collars like this, black collars, I like them. I think they're very attractive and I think they're use, useful for working. Now I want to uh, mention, uh, how do you hollow? What's the procedure? And I'm gonna show these, but first I wanna show three different schools of thought here. Let's see, oops, where's my, all right, so the standard one is uh, the David Ellsworth technique. He invented hollowing, you're probably aware. And um, he um, used, um, 
he just starts sticking the tool in and hollowing it out. And he um, he goes step by step. So he'll he'll hollow this first area. Whoops. First area, second area. These are roughing cuts. He's not that concerned with uh, um, uh, quality of the cut or anything. Or just, and then he does this third cut where he's he's fine tuning the day, uh, the uh, wall thickness. Only then, when he's completely hollowed out this first portion of the of the hollowing, does he go to the next layer and he does again four or five roughing cuts and then finishing up with a, a finishing cut to get the final wall set thickness. And then he goes deeper in and deeper into the piece. Okay, so that's the way that he teaches. Um, the second um, uh, idea is to, to drill a hole before you start. And this is an example of this. This is Pascal Uday. He's a French uh, Turner, very um, famous art artist. He uh, drills a hole before he starts. Many people do. Most people, I would say, you can barely see the. Um, you can see the hole here. Oops, I didn't want to do that. I don't know what I did. Yeah. All right. Let me go back here. Um, you can see the hole it poking through the wood there. But again, after he drills the hole, I'm sure the the hole went the entire length of this piece here. Then again, though, he, he, he hollows in segments, one, two, three, and only when he gets to the final wall thickness does he go down and do four, five, and six. And the idea here is that number one, you're leaving a, a lot of wood down on the bottom so that the piece is very sturdy and not flimsy and not vibrating. And the second thing is, especially if you're turning green wood, which is much, much easier to, to hollow than uh, dry wood, you don't get a... Um, um, uh, you don't, you're able to get fully smooth uh, um, walls, uniform walls before the sample starts to warp. Okay. But the, the, um, the one that I like the best, the method that I follow the closest is John Jordan's method. Here again, he um, drills a hole and he drills the hole pretty much where he wants to stop. So he uses the, uh, the, the uh, depth of this drilled hole to decide how deep he wants to go. Um, and then he hollows the whole thing out to a relatively thick wall. Um, so instead of going one, two, three, he will do one, two, three, four, five, all roughing cuts, maybe like that, and, and gets a constant thick wall. And then he'll go back and he'll and he'll start to um, he'll start to uh, get, uh, go inch by inch down the piece to get the final wall thickness, just small bits at a time, and that's sort of more closely to what I do. But I don't exactly follow this. But this is closer to my um, to my method. Also, notice here this is the chuck. This is the uh, tenon on the on the wood piece, and you can see that the tenon looks like this. This is, um, he actually designs his pieces, which I do also, where the final piece is in the tenon part, okay? Like this, is as opposed to designing the piece where it would, the vessel ended here, and then you would just part it off at some point like this. So anyways, that's the way I'm going, okay? Um, this is an example from my own work. This is a vase. It's vaulted sycamore. It's one of my favorites of, I've ever done. It's I've probably done 50 of this shape. This one, I think I've approached the perfect shape better than anything I've ever done. And I hope I could do it again someday. But uh, basically, uh, I think I got this, um, I got this curvature uh, pretty much perfect. And I'll show you how I did that. Okay, so here is the piece, as you would see it on the lathe, sideways. Um, you can see that the, the initial block was uh, something like this, this red square. Um, I drilled a hole all the way down, but not all the way to the bottom. Because um, at this point, I don't know. Um, actually, before I drill the hole, 
I do this outside shape. And the shape from here to here, including the uh, neck area, is pretty much final form at this point. However, I, I taper it down more like this yellow line where it's much thicker at the bottom. Again, because I like to keep the, the wood stiffer before I hollow too, too much. But now at this point, I'm not quite sure what my final shape is gonna be. I don't know if, uh, if I'm going to um, curve it in this much or just a little bit. And how, I don't know how deep the piece is gonna go. Is it gonna go into the chuck tenon area or is it gonna end sooner? I don't know that. So I don't drill the hole all the way as deep as, uh, as I can, okay? So then when I hollow, I, I, I oops, I shouldn't have done that. I, um, I will go down like this, enlarge the hole as much as I can, not like this. And I'll come maybe, and this is all with the straight tool. Maybe um, I'll do this, clear out as much as I can. And then I'll start, then I'll get, and then I'll start approaching, uh, get out a bent tool and get part way around the shoulder. And again, I'll achieve somewhat of a, um, I'll leave the wood relatively thick down here, but I'm getting thinner here. At this point, then I'll stop. Now, once I'm, be, once I'm beyond the halfway point, so, or the widest part of the piece, um, so the, this is where the torque is the largest because it's the farthest distance from the spindle axis, et cetera. So at this point, I'm, uh, I'm stopping um, hollowing for a while, and I'll go back and I'll fine tune the, um, the outside shape. So first I'll maybe, oops, I gotta do that right. Um, maybe I'll cut it back this far, then I, maybe it'll go like this. And then I say, oh, I don't like that. I'm coming, coming in a little bit more. I'm stopping, I'm looking sideways. I'm trying to decide how deep I'm gonna go and uh, basically it might take me eight or nine tries before, you know, of, of different contours before I'm happy with the contour. At that point then, it's still thick. It still, uh, it still looks like something maybe like this. Um, it'll, I'll reach this level and then, it, but it'll still be thick like this. Um, at that point, I'll return to the uh, turn to hollowing, and I'll and then I will start back up here, and I will get the final wall thickness all the way down. And then here again, the wood is relatively thick at this point, something like that. Um, I'll uh, I'll gradually remove this stuff to get the final thickness. Then I'll take it out of the rig, reverse the piece, and finish the bottom. So that's how I'm going to show working today. All right, so I'm going to go back to the, uh, uh, any questions about that before I go back to the movie? You drill a uh, hole opening all the way, to the full size hole opening all the way to the bottom? I do not go all the way to the bottom. Um, and, the, and the hole is not full size in, in terms of diameter. It's usually, maybe a, the, uh, the hole might be closer to, um, this hole is probably closer to an inch, inch and a quarter, but I probably drilled a three quarter inch diameter hole because I want to, I, I don't want to be limited by the bits itself. I want to be limited by my artistic choices. Also, this distance is not the, the final distance because I haven't decided yet. I like to stop and tweak the, the contour at the, for the second half, the bottom half, um, before I decide how deep I'm gonna go. So at, at some point, I'm gonna use my straight boring bar to uh, remove wood from here like this to get exactly where I want. Mike, yes. what's the ratio from the, for the base on that? The diameter or the hole entrance for the base of it? Well, um, let's see. Rules of thumb for design is you got to make 15 or 20 of these and decide which ones you like the best, I guess is the bottom line. But my personal choices are, first of all, the widest part, uh, didn't want to do that. The widest part of the vase is roughly two thirds of the way up. 
Okay. Uh, you could do the opposite. You could put the widest part of the base down here, like an op, and those work also. I've done several of those. That was the one I, for example, um, this one on the upper left is, is sort of like that. So you could do that also. Those are quite pleasing in my opinion. A lot of Native American pottery from the Southwest are in this shape. Okay. The, All right, so getting back to this. Um, so um, the size of the foot, in my opinion, this is the hardest thing to learn. Uh, many people like uh, they come down and they make the piece too fat at the bottom. And they don't continue the curve all the way. This is a very, I think, pleasing curve. If you come down, a lot of people, they, they start to do the curve and then it becomes flat or straight. And I think that that's a design, uh, something you have to work on on your design. So, um, but in terms of the, um, the diameter of the foot, it's on the small side. It looks like to me, I, I don't uh, measure it, but this is probably, I don't know, uh, one, uh, one seventh or one eighth of the total di uh, diameter, something like that. And also I, I use the, the entry hole as a guideline. So I usually um, keep the entry hole and the foot roughly the same diameter. So sometimes I look at it and it looks, this looks too, the foot looks too fat because the, the uh, the, the, the neck is, is or the, the opening is on the large side or on the small side. So then I try to uh, redesign the, uh, re, or refine the, the foot diameter to get the, this, this and this roughly the same. That's the best I can answer for you. Okay, that's good. Okay. Mike, another question? Sure. Do, do you ever find have you ever find it if you look away? Now, I know you use a jig a lot, uh, but if you've done it manually, do you ever find that uh, if you actually look away from the work that you're doing or close your eyes while you're hollowing, you really get a much better feel of what's going on inside? Yes, yes. What I do, or what I used to do, I don't do it as much now because I'm, I think I'm my, I've calibrated myself better. But in the old days, I used to get to a certain point, three quarters done hollowing, three quarters done shaping and or actually I, I, I get to the point where I think it, I, I was complete with the outside shape then I put a, a plastic bag over the piece and I'd go upstairs and have a cup of coffee or something just get out of the shop and come back and look at it with fresh eyes and I found that to be very helpful. Um, I still do that on occasion um, but more often than not I think I can um, if I just step away or something, I, I get a, a refresh my, uh, my view and then I, uh, uh, I, I can become confident of my shapes. I, I found when I was teaching this to boys uh, uh, at school that I, I, as, they were, as they were starting to hollow, I'd make them look away from the piece and everything went a whole lot smoother because they had a much better feel for what was going on. They were almost visualizing it while they were hollowing. If you're hollowing by hand, oh, to to excavate the interior, you certainly can do it um, with your eyes closed. Yes, um, and it is. And, and in fact, David Ellsworth sort of recommends that also. You're doing a lot by feel, and that's great. And it and you do. Um, I do do a lot by feel. I never quite trust myself to close my eyes totally, but you do a lot by feel. All right, now I wanna mention a few other things before I go back to the uh, video. Um, it's sort of out of sequence, but I I'm just feel a little bit better but not switching back and forth all the way. Okay, vibration is your biggest issue when you're, when you're um, hollowing, okay? Um, you, patience is very critical to doing this. You can only um, excavate so much of the hollow form before you have to stop and get rid of the shavings. So if you have, if you're uh, starting to feel vibrations, you better decide what you're doing right or don't, doing wrong and, and fix it before it's too late. So stopping, I might only hollow for a minute 
and then turn off the lathe, remove shavings, and then start up again. So if you're doing this by hand, you get into a sequence of uh, cutting for a minute, removing the shavings, getting out the calipers, measuring the wall thickness, and then sticking the, the tool back in and repeating that dozens of dozens of times, okay? If you use a jig, frequently you could uh, accelerate that because you don't have to use the calipers as much because you're using uh, either a laser or a camera to, uh, to help you visualize, okay? The other thing that you need to check is the tightness of your set screws. On occasion, they'll loosen up. There is vibrations occurring here. And um, always, uh, I frequently have to tighten my set screws on my uh, different jigs. You cannot take too heavy of a cut. The more heavy the cut is, the more vibration you'll have. And I'll show another picture that uh, in the second, cover, covering both the orientation of the cutter to the wood and how heavy of a cut you're taking. The other importance is grain direction and not, sometimes you'll hit a knot and, you, and it'll be a, uh, an issue with uh, vibration. Again, grain direction, you wanna try to cut uh, with supported grain. And if it's the pieces end grain versus side grain, it'll make a difference. Your tool, you don't want to get your tool below center. You'll get vibrations, certainly. And extension over the tool rest is also an issue here. So in this case, I, I have a little table if you have a quarter inch diameter shaft, you can only hollow up really much Christmas ornaments. Um, half inch diameter shaft allows you to do quite nice sized vases, six or seven inches deep. That's the distance off over the tool rest that you can extend these, these uh, boring bars. Five inches bars get you a little bit more and the three quarter inch bars get you to, as far as I go, 12 inches. I've actually done 14, but it's, it was very, very slow going. You have to take extremely light cuts um, to get beyond 12 inches. Um, I mentioned this torque issue in the past. Um, also things you have to check, again, you're almost always um, uh, hollowing green wood. So you, uh, the wood can be drying, it can be, uh, moving, the chuck jaws can be squishing it, and, and so you tighten the, jaw, the chucks every now and then. Of course, sharpening your tools is always a, a nice idea. And again, also which can cause vibration is if you don't have enough wood at the base. So if, you, if it's too thin at the bottom, it, it's gonna vibrate no matter what. And that's true with you're making a standard bowl or making a hollow form. Okay, now I wanna go back to these two here. Cutter orientation to the wood and cut too heavy. All right, so this is um, the way you're supposed to cut. And this is these drawings are taken from Lyle Jameson, but I modified them. So basically the idea is you take off roughly an eighth of an inch at a time, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, certainly not three sixteenths or a quarter. That would be too heavy. And you and you're sort of like you go in a little bit and then you you push the, or you pull the, to, the tool towards the uh, uh, towards yourself away away from the, the center of the uh, away from the spindle axis. So you so you remove a little bit. You go down. You make another cut. Let's see if this is easy. You cut a little bit off. Cut a little bit more off. You return to the center and keep on cutting little bits and pieces off. Okay. So that's the preferred way of going. And uh, these two over here are examples of things that you can get into trouble with excessive vibration. And the first one is just taking too big of a of a of a cut on each um, on e each pass. Okay, that'll cause vibration for sure. And this one here um, is also an issue. In this case, you you might start. Um, by taking just a, a, a similar small amount of cut here, but because you're pushing towards the headstock, in addition to um, in, in addition to moving this way, you're, you're cutting at this uh, like a 45 degree angle. You're gradually getting deeper and deeper into the into the piece, and now you have contact of the cutting tool around the whole edge, and you can get vibrations this way too. So you're going to see examples of vibration when I do hollowing and. You're going to try to uh, try to remember these concepts. Okay, and go back to the movie. Okay, so um, what I'm uh, recommending you do is you start learning to hollow with a very large mouth of a, of a piece. And this one here, 
uh, you can see is um, it's just a straight, uh, like a box shape. And um, I, these, these are not waste of time. These are not just practice pieces. These can become um, fully made uh, 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 final pieces. You see this one in my hand, it's a piece of pear. I, I hollowed out that whole thing and now I'm letting it dry. So there's the, it's gonna be a lidded jar where um, this is the, uh, the bottom, this is the lid. And um, so you could start by making these lidded jars with a very large opening. It's much easier to see the tool and decide what you're doing. So anyways, this is an example of, of, of a very, of a e easy, uh, easily hollowed piece. This is what you practice on, okay? So here again, I'm truing, uh, when I stick, you stick the uh, piece in the, um, um, in the chuck, you have to retrue it up a little bit especially the face, so the spindle gouge. You can see I'm wearing protective equipment. I've got my powered air respirator, the helmet. Um, the air filter unit is attached to that belt and it's hanging off my the back of me like a fanny pack. Again, that kind of cut there, the spindle gouge with a, on an end grain piece um very clean cut going from the outer diameter to the inner diameter so again this is end grained so that means the the grain is in the direction of that pencil and the preferred way of cutting end grain is from the center outwards so the first thing i usually do is i drill a hole see i have my uh my about a three eighths inch diameter i think three eighths or three sixteenths uh maybe three eighths and um, I have a little rubber O-ring on the end that helps me decide how deep I'm gonna cut. If you don't have that O-ring, you could use a piece of tape or a rubber band or just even a magic marker. So you have to start the hole, get it nice and smooth so that the um, drill has a purchase. Now, drilling in the end grain, you know, is, is much more difficult than drilling in the side grain. So it takes me four or five uh, passes to get, to remove the wood here. You'll see later on when I, when I hollow out a side grain piece, the drill goes in like it's butter. This is oak, by the way, it's a piece of oak that uh, Steve Cheshire uh, helped me harvest from the Metro Parks. Um, we thought we were getting end, or, uh, big enough pieces to get uh, quarter sawn sycamore, when I got it home and looked at it, it wasn't sycamore at all. It was oak, kind of disappointed. But so it's, it's dried for a while, and um, it's actually not that good of a wood. I mean, it's it was a pain in the ass to cut, but um, for pre for demonstration purposes, it'll be fine. And I might turn this into a lidded box at the end. Okay, so here you are with a with a straight um, straight boring bar. You see I am using the Jameson style uh, tool rest that has a threaded tool post and it has a, a nut on there. That's, I find that uh, one of the best things I ever made. Um, I had a friend who could weld a threaded rod to a, a, a plain rod. Of course, Jameson sells these. They're not that expensive. The last time I looked, I don't know, certainly maybe $50, $60. So I haven't looked in several years. But they're well worth it. I think that the, the, the threaded tool post with a nut for determining tool height is a great idea. So here I'm um, um, I'm cutting from the from the hole outwards. And that's the preferred way of doing it. Um, I did try a little bit of cutting from the in the opposite direction. The outer ring there I cut in the opposite direction, and I'm pointing out tear out where the, uh, the cut is not that clean. And also the resistance to cutting is kind of, uh, it's definitely higher if you cut in the wrong direction. So cutting the inside uh, from the inside out is the way to go. And you can see here, I'm practicing this, moving it in the tool bit in about an eighth of an inch and moving it to the side, just an inch or an eighth of an inch and then moving back and starting over and cutting it slowly like this.
Now you can cut both ways. Here I'm cutting back and forth. And sometimes, sometimes it's easier to do that. And now you can take advantage of different parts of the tool bit that are still sharp that way. But I tend, uh, uh, more often than not, I will, do, I will do that on side grain pieces and not on end grain like this. Now I'm switching to the woodcut tool. Again, this is great for uh, end grain boxes like this, but um, it's not quite as good for, or I haven't figured out how to use it for hollowing, although it can be done. Um, but this is producing shavings instead of sawdust. And on good green wood like that, um, this piece of Bradford pear here that I cut uh, when the wood was exceedingly wet, you should have seen the shavings flying off of that. They were like, wow. I mean, it cut like butter and hollowed out that whole thing in like a, a few minutes. Now, with a, with a hook tool like this, um, the cutting surface should be better, should be quite good. In this case, the wood was, a, I would call a difficult wood and it wasn't quite as good. But anyways, here um, I'm showing honing. That's a diamond credit card honer. Um, this is not how I usually hold it. I was supposed to be showing how to hone for the camera. It's not the greatest view, but I usually hold the tool upright, vertical, rather than at a 45 degree angle. But basically I'm practicing, I'm getting better at honing, not perfect. I could probably hone to uh, add, this, add the, um, the burr back on these cutting tips maybe three or four times before I remove the tip and take it to the, the grinder and get it, get it really nice. Okay, you can see this is a little bit closer up view. I'm, um, again, mostly I'm cutting um, out from the hole out. Not hold, it's not need, you don't need a death grip on these, especially if you're not removing a lot of wood. At it. Uh, you can see I'm very, barely um, holding onto the, the tool and sort of pressing down on the tool on the tool rest, but not that much. It's really, um, and I don't know if you noticed before that I had that tool um, buried under my armpit and I'm um, cutting by swiveling my hips rather than moving my arms. Again, sixteenth of an inch, nibbling, nibbling away, sixteenth of an inch at a time, an eighth of an inch at a time. I'll switch Mike, to the hook tool. Hmm? Go ahead. What speed are you running at? Well, when I'm doing regular um, hollowing with that, um, with the boring bar, with the, the steel tips, I'm probably at a thousand, roughly whatever you I do to turn a bowl or turn the outside, I, I hollow the same. But with this hook tool, you have to slow it down. And if you're having trouble, if the wood, is, if it's clogging, for example, that means you're spinning too fast. So I turned down the speed to maybe 500 for the, uh, for this tool that's presently using. Okay. Well, the problem I'm having is tear out on the bottom. And I increased the speed up to uh, 1300 RPMs and it wasn't as bad. Well, yes, that could possibly work for you. It depends. Is that an end grain piece or a side grain piece? And stuff end like grain. that. Yeah. Well, also, again, what I'm going to show my method is I use the standard, those small bits for 90% of the roughing out. And then I switch to this tool here with a, with a teardrop cutter to get the final smoothing. And that's usually okay. the best way to go. So the final smooth, again, I'm showing that you want to be, uh, with the straight part of the shaft if over the tool rest. If you have the round part over, you'll get uh, the torque will be excessive and you'll get uh, catches. So I'm moving the tool rest back so I can keep the, the straight part of the tool on there. And you're just making very thin, um, slight, um, slight passes here just for smoothing. Now, if you watched Lyle Jamison do the do his demo for us, or you, you saw John Jordan doing the one for the um, for the AAW. Both of those guys are slightly better than me, <laughs> and they can get smooth surfaces with a small cutting tip. I I find it much easier 
to use these large teardrop cutters to get to get smooth surfaces. But even when this one, the, the surface wasn't that good because this wood wasn't that great. And you can see here, I'm rotating the shaft so that I'm doing more of a negative rake <clears throat> with the piece. And this does improve the cut on this wood. But um, this, is, this wood was uh, uh, not my favorite. Mike, when you're cutting with all the tips, are, are you not at 90 degrees? You're tipping the, the cutting bit at a no, usually, 80 degrees? Usually they're flat, horizontal, but sometimes when I, I can play, with, if I'm caught, if I'm uh, hollowing by hand, I can switch over and uh, and do a negative rate cutting, but I don't do that that often. Uh -huh. the, the cutting tips, the, the hunter carbides are, are uh, meant to be used with the, with the with the cutter slanted at like 30 degrees off of flat. Well, I got that Trent Bosch system and I was using it straight and I was having a hard time. So I put it on a slight angle and it cut better. Yes, yeah, he teaches that. All right. Hey Mike, so, how, um, how far, uh, what kind of relief do you put on those teardrop, teardrop cutters? Um, it's the same angle as the the regular the straight bits, so seventy five degrees something like that. Seventy, eighty even would work. Sixty five would work. Like, have you thought about or have you had any reflections on regrinding those so that they are a negative rake configuration? Um, yeah. I've thought about it. I haven't done it. We had a demonstrator a few years back. His name was uh, Professional Turner from, I think, North Carolina. His name was uh, Farrar, Robert Farrar. I forgot his first name. He was an excellent cutter or uh, hollower. And um, Charles Farrar, that was his name. Anyways, he, for his final smoothing, he went to a negative rake teardrop. And uh, he liked that quite a bit. It's, it makes sense to me. I just haven't done it. If, yeah. All right, so I'm pointing out that this is a side grain piece as the wood comes off. Now, when you're scraping with the side grain uh, piece, you can go in both directions. But uh, in general, um, you would want, want to go cutting downhill, which is be the same as what you would be doing when you're hollowing a bowl. So that would be from the fat uh, part of the diameter to the um, to the small part of the design when you're on the inside. Now here, um, I'm not going to be um, talking about shaping the outside so much, especially on this practice piece, but I wanted to show you a technique that I like for difficult woods. This wood is again, dried oak and it was not cutting that cleanly. I had better luck uh, finishing up this, uh, the outside surface with the shear scrape. You can see the handle is down by my pocket my jeans of my jeans and I wetted this I squirted water on the material on the wood to get uh, a slightly better cut so I was able to achieve a pretty good cut where I would start probably start sanding at 150 or so which would have been if I didn't use the shear scrape I would have been starting at I don't know 60 or 80 grit but I'm just touching it up um, here before I start hollowing and showing. This is, again, I'm gonna just be showing um, a broad, uh, so you can see how the tool is interacting with the wood before I actually do a hollowing example. So again, I'm uh, uh, set up that rubber O-ring so that I know how deep to drill and you can see how much easier it is to drill into side grain. Two steps and it was done. <laughs> Now, um, I'm going to be using the Kelton hollowers here just as a, for variety. These are the three Kelton hollowers, straight, medium, and big bend, big, medium bend, and big bend. Now, you'll see, I think I'm going to have to adjust the tool rest here, and you can see how convenient it is to use these, um, that threaded uh, tool post.
All right, so here I'm I'm cutting outwards from the center hole outwards. And you know when you drill, the uh, a twist standard twist twist drill like that doesn't necessarily go straight into the wood. So I like to keep the hole on the small side, and you can true it up by hollowing. So I'm hollowing in both directions here. The resistance to cutting with this piece in, in the two different directions, it's pretty much identical. When you do end grain, if you, if you um, cut in the preferred direction, which is inside out, um, the resistance to cutting is much uh, less than if you cut from the outside in. Here it's about the same and I'm looking and the, and the cut quality is roughly the same in the two different directions, in and, uh, inside out and outside in. But again, the same concept of moving my body, holding the holding the tool handle against the my body, tw swiveling my hips rather than moving my uh, hands, and taking off small nibbles. So here I'm creating a little bit of a hollow form so that you can see how I would hollow around the corner with a curved the curved shaft, the swan neck tool. Now, in, you know, this doesn't look that much different in this case of actually of hollowing out a bowl. And in, case, and in fact, I like these, uh, these straight boring bars a lot. And I sometimes use them to hollow out the bowl, a, a standard bowl rather than using a bowl gouge. I, could, I would rough it out that way. I could do that probably faster than I could rough out a bowl with a bowl gouge. So they're pretty useful tools and they never catch. Rare, real hard to get them to catch. When I first started turning, I only had two tools. I had a, uh, a, a straight boring bar that I used, and I had um, a parting tool that I made out of a kitchen knife. Then I uh, added a, a, that easy wood carbide tool, and then I added uh, my homemade carbide tools, and um, now I have about a thousand tools. But I did quite a bit of, of, of hollowing by hand using homemade tools um, at a very, without spending a lot of money. Okay, here's a swan neck tool. This is probably the medium bed. Okay, you can see a little bit, and I'm at a higher magnification. Again, you could cut in both directions with side grain. But again, you're taking off this nibbling cut. You're gonna see a lot of that today. With a sharp tool bit like this, again, if I was really uh, hustling, I could take, I could really hollow out this this type of bowl in just a few minutes. As a bowl, as a hollow form, of course, it would take much longer because you have to stop a lot to uh, empty the shavings. What's the width of that cutter? Three sixteenths. checking the quality of the cut. It's a decent quality cut, better than the end grain, but it's not perfect. Mike, how do you sharpen that cutter? Do you just do the top or do you do the- I do the bevel. The you bevel. do the, mostly the bevel. When I'm honing, I always, I, I try to hone with that credit cards cutter or credit cards uh, hone, uh, diamond hone. Um, I, do, I still do the bevel. I hold it on the heel the card on the heel and I, I tilt it up until the, the, um, the cutting surface is touching with the, um, with, the diamond, with the diamond card. So the, both the heel and the, and the cutting surface are, are touching the, the hone and then I uh, rub it up and down. When I, t when I um, take it onto the uh, grinder, I do the same thing. I'm only I, I set up my uh, tool rest so it, it's always at that 70 degree angle. I never change it. And I, uh, I just sharpen the bevel. So these bits, they wear out. I mean, um, I don't know. They still last more than a year a piece and they're only three or four bucks, these little ones. 
But the Kelton hollower is a little bit different. That's just regular steel with uh, maybe there's a 16th inch high speed steel um, cutting surface soldered onto them. So if you if you were honing the top, you'd eventually wear it out. So you'd have to use the bevel, uh, touch up the bevel only. Now with those um, those Keltons, I don't sharpen those more than once or twice a year with on the on the uh, grinding wheel. I usually use just the honing. And I'm happy with that. You prefer carbide over high-speed steel? No, I do not. I don't use my carbide hard cutters hardly at all anymore. Now the Hunter one, it's not because of the quality of the cut. The quality of the cut is quite good, but I'm not an expert at using it and I tend to, since I know how to use the high speed steel ones, it seems like I'm reluctant to learn or invest the time. I, uh, time I'd, I'd much rather just use the high speed steel ones. I can do pretty good. So you can see now I'm going around the corner. I'm not really holding that, uh, that um, hard on the tool rest. I'm, because of this angle and I'm trying to stay out from blocking the camera, my body is, is, is sort of far away and the tool handle is not, uh, resting against my body like I prefer, but be, uh, it's not that hard to, uh, the torque is not that hard that you have to use a death grip. So I've hollowed out maybe the top inch or so, a little bit more, using the calipers to check the side or the wall thickness. Running across there, I decide it's a little bit thick in a certain few places, and then I go back and I touch it up. I also use my fingers as much as I can. So at this point, um, if you're working on the side wall, you're using the tip of the tool. So the tip is shaped like this. Using uh, it's not perfectly round. Anyways, you're using the tip to excavate the wood. When you're doing the the um, the top lid, you're not using that part of the tool. You're using this part of the tool. So, anyways, and you're seeing more of a. Uh, I think you'll see more of a tendency for shavings here than you do with the end grain piece, rather than just sawdust. So then I go back and I check the wall thickness and I'm happy with it for that first inch or so. So if I was making a complete uh, hollow form here, I'd then remove another several inches and, and do the same. Now I'll show you again the effect of using a teardrop shaped cutter I'm going to take just a few very, even though I don't have the um, tool rest in the proper position, I'm just taking very light finishing cuts, um, just like I do in a bowl. And that surface is extremely nice. I don't know, 220 grit, 240 grit for surface for sure. So I would do that um, quite for quite a bit of the, of the uh, wall. Wall, uh, wall length. Okay, so now I'm switching. This is, um, I'm showing you how I do most of my cutting or most of my hollowing. I'm using the Jameson system. Here is the, uh, the swivel head in the straight boring bar, three quarter inch diameter, three sixteenths inch cutting tip. See the boring bar is connected to the um, to this D shape, let's see if I get a little bit farther. I can't, this backrest here, the, the three quarter inch bar uh, slides in this slot and, and uh, prevents the, the, uh, the, any torque from causing the, the tool to rotate. You can still get vibration, but you, you do not get um, very bad catches at all. This shaft here goes up to hold the laser. And Jameson sells the laser and he believes in the laser. He doesn't believe in the camera. There's really, uh, when I read on the online forums and stuff, 
there's, it's roughly split down the middle. Some guys learned on the lasers and love the lasers. And the other half of the people, they didn't like lasers and they liked the camera. And I'm in that second half. So this holder here comes with the Jameson system. These, this lever here allows you to slide the, uh, slide the uh, holder back and forth to adjust to the individual cutters. And the laser would fit into this hole here. I made this little um, device to hold the, the camera. The camera is down here. It's, the camera itself is only a uh, 3 16 inch diameter camera. Can't even see the camera that well. And, you, and basically, the, um, um, that coil and cable in the back goes, plugs into the USB of my laptop. And this is an old laptop. I would never use a new laptop down in my shop. It's way too dusty. But this old one, I blow it out. I have to blow it out uh, frequently because it collects dust. But basically, the camera plugs in as a, into the USB port in this old laptop. And you shine, and it's shining onto the um, shining onto the um, cutting tip, and um, it's displaying on the laptop screen. So when you have this in here, um, you'll notice whenever I move the cutting tip, the camera will move with the cutting tip. So as I move it around, you see the cut the camera is moving as the cutting tip is moving. Now I move it over the um, over the bedways, so you could see the chuck key sitting there. And you can see that whatever, you know, again, you know exactly where your, your cutting tip is because you have this camera sh shining down. But look what happens. You stick it inside a hollow form. And of course, the camera is now blocked by the wood and you can't see what's inside. So that's a dilemma. And Trent Bosch was the one who came up with this idea of, of how to use a camera. And so you draw on the screen on the laptop with a dry erase marker, you draw the contour of the cutter onto your laptop screen. Then when you stick the camera or the piece into the camera, you know where the cutter is. I think it's so nifty. When I first discovered this, I mean, people try to explain it in paragraphs worth of descriptions and you still don't quite get your head around it. But then when you see it in action, it's so simple, it's amazing. So anyways, now you know exactly where the cutter tip is inside your hollow form. You can see here I'm banging against the inside wall. Now, how do you make this more accurate? Well, this is where you could draw the wall thickness on your thing. So I tend to do, um, I draw it by freehand, but what I'm using is I know that the, um, the cutter tip, or the cutter I'm using is 3 16 So I sort of use that to calibrate myself to draw a 3 16 diameter spread around there. Now, some guys, they want to be more accurate. They put a ruler underneath the camera and they draw exactly how thick they want this piece to, to be. And if you're good at that, so so uh, more power to you. But this, I'd like to get it to this 3 16 inch thick, and then I do smoothing and I end up closer to a a little bit thinner, not usually one eighth, but a little bit thinner than what the what this laser uh, what this setup is right now. So I draw that. Now, when I stick the piece inside the hollow form, you see that. Now, when I bang it into the wall, you can see here that cutters here. What my intended wall thickness is here, three sixteenths inch and the wall itself is still here. So this much material needs to be removed until this ink drawn line is, uh, is on top of the wall, the diameter or the outside diameter of the piece. So you can see here, the wall thickness is roughly half inch. I gotta get rid of half, a little bit more. So this one is not quite done yet. You see here, I'm a little bit thinner. I only need to remove maybe an eighth of an inch or so. And at the top, I left it relatively thick yet. And that was a little bit intentional that I was thinking of doing some carving on this one. And I thought I might want a thicker wall for that reason. All right, now I'm gonna show you how to set up uh, the Jameson rig. All these rigs, the main ones, the most popular ones in the United States are right now are the Trent Bosch rig and this, and the elbow hollowing tool. That's, um, and then this, and the Jameson rig of the three. And then Simon Hope sells one in England that is, uh, roughly considered in the top top echelon. 
Also, Steve Sinner has a very nice one that's more customized for um, deep hollowing. And there's others too. Clark, Clark Hollowing Systems has a very excellent one. And there's others too. Basically, though, here I am adding my uh, threaded tool post with a, with a, it's a one inch diameter threaded rod with eight, eight uh, threads per inch. Now the Jameson system comes with a with a, a, a post, a tool post for the backrest, which it's called the backrest. But I have my lathe comes with two banjos, so I just prefer to use the banjo. It's a heft, heftier machine; it's easier to adjust like that. This is the backrest. Goes in there, slides down to that ink drawn line, and I tighten it there. I really should put a stop collar on there so I get more consistent results. I did buy a stop collar to put on put on that shaft, but I forgot where I put it. Can't, I've been looking for it for about 18 months. Here's the, the uh, hollowing rig. It's called a D-shaped handle. Stick the shaft in, and tighten it. This is one of the set screws that you have to check frequently to make sure it's tight. If you're getting vibration, it'll vibrate loose. Okay. Getting the, the wire from the, that's the USB cord that comes with the camera. Here you can see here, the camera is, uh, uh, this pe this wooden dowel that I uh, turned, it has a slot in it like that. Um, and the, the, it's taped in with uh, aluminum foil tape and it's got a 16 foot uh, cord that goes uh, back to the, goes up to the ceiling over and down to the laptop. And it, there's some slop in it. And when I, when it's over here, I like, I, I have a little clamp that I uh, put it so that it's out of, out of the, uh, out of harm's way. Here's the piece I'm going to be turning today. I decided I was going to do a very simple one, then I decided, well, maybe it's more in interesting to turn a, a more difficult shape. So this one here, that beautiful piece of maple. Um, it's wider than it is tall, but it's not it's not a, a truly uh, flying, flying saucer shape. See, it's a, I pretty much have this entire contour uh, curved, uh, finalized. And I've got uh, the top contour is slight curvature, but it's more flat than it is curved. And I've drilled a hole down to about here. Now this piece um, has a big branch, a rotted branch going through the bottom. And it comes out two places there, right here. And you see it came out here and there's a relatively big void right here. And so I, no way would I was I comfortable using a chuck in that condition, so I used a face plate on this one. Face plates are really nice. You should probably start with a face plate, anyways, because it it does reduce vibration compared to a chuck. You just have to plan to make sure you don't cut into the the screws that are used with the face plate. All right, I'm going to stop here for a second. I'm going to go back here. All right. Okay, so this is the side view of what you're going to be seeing hollowing. This is the, um, let's see how I do that, control two. Here's the face plate. This is the wood that I, I'm using. It has, it's damaged wood. It's got a big hole void right there. This is maybe- uh, Mike. Yes? We're not seeing it. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. All right, my fault. All right, so this is the face plate. This is uh, waste wood. It's got a hole in it, void right here that I can't use uh, or much of it. This, this, the screws are probably one inch screws. They go through a half inch here, about into this depth, okay? 
I have this contour is pretty much finalized, but it's still much thicker. The tannin is much thicker than my final bottom will be. Um, Before we've got that picture up, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, the uh, camera that you have is mounted exactly as you would mount a laser. Yes. Why do you prefer the camera system as opposed to the laser system? Um, I like it because it, I find it more intuitive. I know it, it takes some time. To, you um, every every time you adjust the tool tip, the rate, the swivel, you swivel the tip a little bit. You have to readjust the laser, the laser point. On, on a piece like this, I might have to do that eight or nine times to hollow it out, and I just found it inconvenient. Number two, um, I wasn't always that great at. Um, um, interpreting the laser dot. I, I had some trouble with it, uh, especially when you go around these corners like this, um, right around here. The, I had a little bit of trouble with the laser. Number three, I like to stand at the end. I'm standing um, uh, where the state, uh, I'm standing facing the headstock at the end of the lathe. Um, if you're using a laser, you really have to stand on the side where you see my picture now. And that's how Jameson teaches it and how Jameson likes to cut. And that's all more power to him. He does it that way, but I don't. So I like to stand at the end. And the laser is blocked in many, in, in many parts of the piece because of that. So those are the main three reasons. Four, reason number four, I think the laser is more susceptible to vibration. Reason number five, um, and, um, I... I, the batteries don't last that long in my in my experience. So all those reasons, I guess. However, again, I'd say 50% of the people still like to use lasers. I think they use, learned it and they like it and there's no reason to change. Thank you, Mark. Okay, what do I wanna do now? So what, I, what I'm gonna show you is I drilled the hole. There's still a, a reasonably sized gap here right here so that later on I'm going to have to hollow down more okay so what I'm going to show I'm going to take out some of this enlarge the hole but um, and then I'm going to um, start going this way I'm going to get rid of all this wood in here whoops I didn't want to do that what happened there I'm gonna get rid of all this wood from about here like this. Okay, so it's still pretty thick down here. Gonna be irregular. Okay, then at this point, um, I'm gonna start, um, I wanna get this maximum diameter um, hollow excavated. So it's gonna take me a while to, to do this. Slower cuts, more vibration. Um, to get this part here. Once this is done, then I'm going to go and I'm going to uh, get the final um, wall thickness from the hole all the way, all the way around to about here. Then I'm going to finish the excavation here. Actually, I, I finish it up to about here, and then I do the center part. So uh, from here, get rid of this, and then uh, merge the final wall thickness here with the final wall thickness there. So that's the scheme. Okay. All right, now um, I'm checking the, the height of the tool, checking on the screen what's happening there. Moving my lathe a bit a little bit to get more clearance. Adjusting the tool height to the again that nut, that threaded nut really helps in setting it and adjusting it maybe a quarter turn, even an eighth of a turn to get the proper height. Boy, you can't really see the cutter. Let me get rid of that um, image there.
again, this should not be surprising to you at this point. All I'm doing is going in an eighth of an inch, nibbling away. I'm enlarging the, the hole of the, of the, um, the central hole um, in a cone shape, getting rid of all that material in the, in the center part. Now there's very little vibration here, which is good, but that's because number one, I'm only off the tool rest four inches and I'm not, I'm, I'm not in a situation where there's very much torque. I'm too close to the spindle axis to get torque. But I could, when I was doing it there, I started to feel resistance and I knew I had to get rid of uh, shavings. In the beginning, there's not much room in, in the, inside the hollow form. It's not hollow yet. So there's not much room for shavings. So again, you can scrape them out with a scrape uh, with a Dairy Queen spoon or th that little hoe that I made, or you can blast it out with an air hose. Now, a piece this big, this is probably 10 inches diameter, four inches deep. I could probably hollow this out in about a half hour. And then I would spend another half hour refining the wall thickness the way I like it. This one probably took closer to an hour and a half because um, I'm not sure why. I think it was having more vibration and I had to cut slower because of that. Now here you're I You're watching something... your laptop. You're watching uh, the laptop on the bench at the far end. Hold on. Say again. You're watching your laptop screen at the bench at the far end? Yes, yes. So if you're, on, if you're standing on the back, where I'm, I like to stand over here, and I can see the, the tool entering the hole. I can see the, you know, what's going on in the cutting area, but I can also see the laptop. Okay. However, right now, I can't see the laptop that clearly because I have got this, uh, my iPhone or my cell phone attached to this uh, arm and it's blocking quite a bit of the view. But in general, that's how I would do it. Um, okay. Now, I don't know if you noticed there, but I felt something weird and the, um, the swivel head had loosened up. So I had, had to tighten it. Again, there's very little vibration. If you look here, you can watch the camera. You will see the, the camera tends to vibrate more than the tool. Very slight vibration of the tool that's tolerable at this point seems to be magnified by this um, tool holder. And so the camera vibrates more than the, the tool does. But you can watch this. At this point, the, the camera is vibrating a little bit, but I'm, I don't consider it limiting. Later on, the camera is vibrating more and the tool is vibrating and I have to change my cutting. Laser is very similar or even worse. So again, nibbling away eighth of an inch at a time, cutting for roughly a minute, stopping and removing the shavings. Now at this point, mostly, um, I wouldn't really call them shavings, it's more like dust, but later on different orientations of the cutter to the wood, um, you'll see lots of curlies coming out of this thing too. And they tend to be a pain in the ass because they, they clog up, they don't come out with the airbrush. You need to even to take uh, tongs or tweezers or something to remove them. Always like to check every now and then. Now you see I'm way, I'm starting to, okay, so now I'm switching. This is the camera view, okay? I've removed quite a bit. Let me stop here for a second. Okay, I, I've, um, I've removed quite a bit of this material. I'm working now on this range here. And, you're, and I switched 
I didn't show it very clearly, you'll see it later, but I switched to the situation where I've got the Jameson bar in there. I've got the, it, the, the swivel tip installed in the 45 degree angle. And I've got the, the swivel tip here and I've got the, um, the steel bit sitting, sitting this way. So in this situation, I'm way far off the, the spindle axis, I'm gonna get more vibration and there's just, you know, this is a, this diameter here is only three eighths of an inch or three or yeah, three eighths probably or three sixteenths even can't remember. So this, this from here to here is relatively prone to vibration. Now, because the Jameson system has that backrest and that big heavy tool uh, with a D shape, I'm not gonna get a catch, but I am gonna get vibration. So you'll see, start to see vibration being more of an issue. All right, again, you can see sort of a nibbling, you see the nibbling motion. And it would, what I'm doing now is I would, um, um, when I get to a certain point in the cut, it goes from smooth to vi too much vibration. And I'm stopping the cut when I feel that vibration and I go back and I start over. So I'm only really cutting from here to here. I would like to be able to cut around here, but you see as the wood, uh, the contour of the, sh of the wall is changing, I'm getting inappropriate uh, matching of the cutter tip to the wall and I'm getting too much vibration. So I'm stopping here, cutting, 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 then I'm coming back here and I'm doing this, this, this and this. Hey, Mike, get that snapshot off the screen. All right. It's, it's cutting smooth here. And I'm getting down to where I'm about maybe a half inch wall thickness at this point. And that's gonna be good for me. Switching to a different location. Now again, you, will not, you won't see this vibration if you're making a standard vase shape. It's only for these ones where um, you have to go far off the off the uh, spindle axis. By the way, um, for those of you who are worried, this is um, there's 34 minutes left on the tape. So you can see now I'm at the maximum diameter. Now, one other thing about the Jameson system is, well, the way I use the Jameson system is I switch tools. I switch between the, the, uh, the Jameson supplied bar and the uh, Stewart bar, the, the gooseneck bar, et cetera. So here you see, now um, you see how uh, much the, the um, camera is, is vibrating now compared to before. This is excessive. I can only cut for a, maybe a, less than an inch of, of travel before I get into trouble. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to adjust the tool height. The farther off I get from center, the more I have to raise the tool. I guess that means that this shaft is not perfectly horizontal. However, um, that's just the way it is. There's a slight gap between the, the uh, bar and the uh, um, slot that it slides through. And I adjust the height. If I have a 
the Kelton hollowers in here. I've got to adjust the tool rest a lot. And if I have a, this, the Jameson bar versus the Stewart bar, I have to change the height. So I like that adjustability. If you were using uh, the Bosch system or the, or the um, elbow articulated system or the Monster one, um, I think you'd be, it's a little bit less convenient to adjust the, the height of the tool, but you might not have to if you have the right boring bars. Okay, so I adjusted the height uh, to try to see if I had better um, uh, vibration. And I noticed that this set screw was a little bit loose. So I tightened that set screw up. A little is bit it, easier to cut now. Is that still a 3 16th cutter? Yes. Yeah. All right, here I'm going to a different uh, part of the, of the hollow form. I'm adjusting the swivel tip. You can see here that this is the boring bar here. Not that clear because the camera is not perfectly aligned with the, this is the shaft of the, of the swivel tip. This is the swivel tip. Um, so it's in that 45 degree uh, orientation, which is a little bit more uh, vibration prone, but necessary to get uh, way off to the end. All right, you see it better now. Um, I swiveled that cutter more in order to get more of the top half um, of the of the hollow form. Okay. So the first thing you do when you stick the piece in there is you go very, very lightly to try to figure out where you are by touch, by feel. You wanna feel where the piece, where the cutter is. Now I found the, the place where the wood needs to be removed and I'm going back to that nibbling cut, as I call it. We're removing an eighth of an inch at a time. And I'm stopping the cut when I feel vibration. So I probably spent uh, 15, 20 minutes removing the bulk of the material, the, the vast majority of the piece, and it'll take me another 20 minutes just to do this corner. Just to do from here to here. Um, this is the most critical part, really, and I'm taking, slow, taking it slow. Forced to take it slow because of the high vibration. <clears throat> so the wall thickness is roughly five eighths now at that point. You are, all, you are also using um, hearing the audio to tell you. I could feel when the cut is nice, you can't, I, the audio, I turned off the audio on the video, but I can hear it when I'm cutting. It's when you're cutting uh, properly, it sounds like a very <clears throat> fine hiss that's almost like extremely smooth sound and when it's vibrating it it's very much like an interrupted cut right, you see i'm getting close in that corner now again the the vibration looks quite severe through the camera but it's not as quite as bad on uh in real life but it's still bad that you bad enough that you want to stop okay so now i've switched to the gooseneck tool, you see it's much thicker shaft or the same size shaft, but you don't have all that uh, protrusion at the end, which was the small diameter stuff that is uh, more prone to torquing. 
You can sort of see what I'm doing up here. Very close to reaching the final wall thickness as I'm going from here. I'm going to be traveling up like this and then again working on this area, which is my the problem area. Much less vibration with this tool because it's swan neck design and it's uh, uh, large diameter. There, look at there, I'm tightening the piece again, checking the set screws. All right, so this is what it looks like on the inside. The teardrop cutter. Now the te teardrop cutter um, has a pointy end, which is good for hogging out actually. And then the other end is more rounded, it's more for smoothing. And you use this entire uh, surface for smoothing. I don't know how Jameson and really, I don't know how Jameson and uh, Jordan can do it without, without resorting to this type of cutter. Now, the other thing I want to point out is, again, with the, with the other uh, uh, setup, I had uh, a very small, thin shaft coming out of the three-quarter inch bar. Here, the three-quarter inch bar goes all the way to the cutter. So that's a, more, that's, that's a much better uh, vibration-resistant situation. Now, if you see my hand down here, I'm adjusting the tool rest. I'm turning that nut to get the proper tool height for this cutter, which is different from the Jameson bar. Okay, I'm feeling around with the lathe off to see where there's bumps, try to get rid of them. See that um, right here, the wall thickness is is quite quite close to final here, but then there's a big bump like this, and it probably looks like this, very bumpy along the road there. Now I'm cutting very slowly. You can see very little vibration at this point, so that's the goal. Got to get rid of that big bump here. So here I'm almost at final thickness here. This is the thickness of the piece. So this, uh, I got to get rid of a, a good quarter of an inch before I'm uh, completed. Very short, small, fine cuts at this point. A little bit of nibbling, moving down the piece. Checking very light cuts until I figure out where I'm at. Again, taking very thin cuts until I get where I want to be. That corner is almost complete, but not quite. You can see I'm getting very close. The, uh, this, this line here gets very close to this contour. and re reposition the, the cutter again. Now, if you're using a laser, again, you'd have to, every time you reposition the cutter, you have to reposition the laser. Not the end of the world. You know, the goal is not, we're not in a speed race here, but I just like the, uh, I like the ability to use the camera. Okay, now I have the broad face of the cutter there. You can see I'm pretty much at final thickness there. There's just some bumps there that I got to get rid of. And I, I try to get rid of all bumps, but I'm most concerned with bumps that are near where people can stick their fingers in and check your work. So I'm cutting now, barely 
fine whispers, just trying to remove slight uh, tool marks, I guess is what I would say. I'm adjusting the height a little bit. My fingers at the bottom here were uh, adjusting that the um, that nut to change the tool height by tiny, tiny increments. How do you align your camera to the tool tip from above? Well, the Jameson system has a, um, the holder allows for sliding up and along that pipe and it also allows you to twist. So what I'm doing is I, uh, I'm looking at the laptop screen and I'm adjusting the, the, uh, the swivel or that the holder, the camera holder by sliding it and tilting it. So if it's not, if you think, if you're a, a geometry expert, you will know if you're, if, if it's not perfectly aligned straight up and down, um, if you're tilt, if you're twisting the camera to get it exactly right for the different tool, tool tips, you are inducing a, a geometrical error. It's called parallax error, um, but it's so tiny, I'm, ex I'm ignoring it. But it only takes a second, maybe 10 seconds to adjust it each time. It takes longer to, uh, to draw on the screen, those contours. Mike, do you want that scraper on center or below center? At or above center. At or above, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more, you'll, you, if you get vibration at this point, you check the tool height. Okay. And it's vibrate. I, I would, my first inclination would be to raise the tool to see if you fit, if it fixes it. Okay. But of course, you, you know, it's not, see right now, um, I've got the, the contour of the wood of the, of the piece is roughly the, matching the, the contour of the tool. So I've reached final thickness there. Okay. But in general, I, I raise the tool rest if I have seat feel vibration. Now, when you're getting to the center and you're moving the center nub, that's a slightly different case. In, in, the, in almost 90% of the piece, it's better to err on the side of being high as opposed to low. But when you're doing the exact center of the piece, you've got to be dead nuts on center and you have to tweak it a lot. And Jameson says you, you like, um, he advises that you use your cutter to, to scribe a line on the inside of the wood and then you shine a light in there and look at it and decide if you have to raise the tool rest or not. I have trouble doing that. I don't see it that clearly. So I do it more by trial and error. I, I start high, I try to cut. And if it doesn't cut, I, I turn the knot, um, quarter of a, uh, eighth of a turn and I try again and I keep on doing that eighth of a turn at a time until I hit it. And sometimes I don't hit it and I, uh, I end up doing it by hand later. Okay. Yeah. Conceivably with the, uh, the other systems there, you would, you would have it nailed down better. But again, I change tools so much, I don't think I could live with that way. So I'd have to figure out, I'd have to buy new tools again to, to make it work with like a, an articulated arm. So. I'm happy with what I got now. All right, so I changed the, the contour there of the or the orientation of the cutter because I'm trying to get a few little nips, uh, bumps off of this front surface. I'm taking very, very thin cuts. And I'm trying to get rid of a, a few bumps. You can see I'm getting dangerously close to being too thin. Take the piece out. I stick my finger in there and I feel the bump. So I'm trying again. Making whisper thin cuts. A lot of times at this point, I will wax the, the tool rest. I will add paraffin wax to the, to the tool shaft, the tool rest and that back rest. And then it makes a difference. It becomes uh, a much finer, um, uh, much more sensitive uh, tool 
much smoother to very little friction uh, resisting the piece. So again, I'm checking that, um, stick my finger in there and I still see that bump. I'm having trouble getting rid of this bump. And if I could feel it with my finger, a customer is gonna feel it with its finger. So, but I'm getting so thin, I'm afraid to go any farther. With the lathe off, I could I'm, I try to find that bump and I try to work just on that piece right there. Just three seconds worth of cutting, trying to get rid of that bump. Very, very, barely touching the wood. Mike, I keep having to remind myself that your tool's not inside my chest. <laughs> All right, now I'm switching to the straight tool. Um, hold on. Okay. Now, what this looks like is um, from here to here, I'm done. This part here is thick and it's bumpy and it might look even like this, okay? So I go back to the straight tool And I get this final uh, final diameter wall thickness um, dialed in or completely excavated. In this case, my contour is already complete. At some at those the previous example I showed, I um, I had stopped at some point of hollowing about here, and I had fine tuned this um, fine tuned this the contour from the bottom half uh, down. But now this is already completed up to this point. So all I'm doing is I want to get to this wall thickness and then I want to get rid of this extra wood right there. Okay, I stuck it in without, for, I for, forgot to change the, uh, the ink marker. There I adjusted the camera a little bit. I moved the camera to adjust for the different length of the tool. Now this, um, I wanna mention something about this, this tool, this bit, the quarter inch bit is, I use it because it's, it, at this point, it's less, vib it's less vibration than the 3 16th bit. Also, I could stick it out of the tool holder. It's sticking out at least an inch, probably an inch. If I stuck out a 3 16th bit this far, it would vibrate too much. So it's 3 16th bit would, would be sticking more like that. Is the marker that you use anything special to avoid uh, damage to the screen of the uh, laptop? Um, it's a dry erase marker, and I have a I have a plastic sheet on top of the laptop screen. It's taped on there with masking tape. But it's the same screen I've used for eight years now. So I think the other nine in the box I'll be willing to give to people who want to try this. Uh, Mike. Yes. When when you're drawing this uh, grease pencil on the screen, you're actually over at your computer then. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Now at this point, I'm cutting, and you can't. I'm the the wall thickness is so uh, so big at this point. You can't even see the outside contour of the of the piece yet because after you move so much of that in um, central um, wood, and just now you're just starting to see in the very corner. Can't even see. Yeah, you can barely start to see it in the corner. Um, the, the how much wood has to be removed. All right, so this is the contour right here. Oh, you can't even see it on your screen. I could see it on mine. Well, I'll let it go a little bit longer. Now you're starting to see it. All right, so here's, well, you might be able to see it, but this is the contour here. 
can barely see it, but you'll see a black blurry thing coming right about here. And that is that large knot passing, through, you know, as it rotates through, and that's sort of obscuring the, the true contour of the uh, piece. But, um, and again, the camera is not given the best image of, of, the, of the unit. Um, so you can't see it as clearly as I can when I'm in the shop. So much, it is a much better image than the one I've been able to reproduce here. Now I'm adjusting the tool height a little bit to get it closer to dead nuts on. So anyways, this might take another, this is the second toughest part to get, is get the, the very bottom uh, very smooth. All right, now you can clearly see the contour here and you'll see some black spots about here every now and then as they rotate past. So the tool's not touching the wood yet, but I've got, it's probably the tool, if I pushed it here, be about here, I've got to remove another half of an inch. Same thing though, nibbling, nibbling, nibbling. So this piece took me an hour and a half to cut through. Um, and now I'm going back to a different uh, view. I just wanted to show that uh, this is actually out of sequence. This is where I'm um, hollowing more of the middle, uh, the initial roughing out. But I wanted to show again that the vibration is evident, but it's not nearly as bad as it was when I was working way off at the outer diameter of the piece. This is with the, the Jamison bar is not, the, the smaller diameter part, portions of the swivel tip are not being uh, stressed. You can see just, um, the shaft is directly into the, into the sh bar without any of that extension. Now, the other thing you, I want you to notice is that as I get from, excavating out in the center part to doing this part here, this this bar is, is slid farther and farther till it reaches a stop. Both uh, whether you use a banjo like I have or the Jameson um, tool rest holder, um, you som I sometimes swivel this, I swivel it way over like this to get farther over the end. And um, you might see a, a few examples of that as I go forward. But again, you can only cut so much because uh, you have to stop to get rid of the shavings. And also on these shapes here, the, when this piece is rotating, the centrifugal force forces all the shavings out into the, um, the fa farther diameter. So when you're working out, if you're working in this area, it, it's very frustrating. You've got to stop a lot to get rid of the shavings. But when you're working on this area, the shavings sort of migrate this way, makes your life a little bit easier. Now, also, I don't think I've no mentioned enough that I'm really not holding that hard, but the fact that you're holding in two places, one hand with each, and even sometimes you're resting the bar against your belly, that's three places where your body is absorbing some of the vibration. And um, certainly uh, when you're roughing out, you need to have at least two hands on them, but they're not really holding on with a death grip, but they are uh, a relatively firm grip. When you're doing the final smoothing, you don't do that. You're barely, you know, using three or four fingers maybe to um, to just barely move the tool. And you see, I was able to remove quite a bit of material and there's a lot of curlies mixed in there. Of course, that depends on the type of wood, the orientation of the piece, maple versus ash. If you were doing um, maple as pro and pear, probably my two favorites in terms of producing clean cuts. Um, my worst is, is probably uh, box elder. You're probably sick of seeing this nibbling cut by now, but I wanted to show how uh, my handle is getting way over um, towards the end of the travel of the 
of the backrest. Now, I would say um, if I was advising people on what rig to buy, I'm certainly happy with a with the Jameson rig. I've always wondered what it would be like to have an articulating holder like or a hollower like the Bosch or the Simon Hope or the um, elbow tool. But I, I'm i sort of like set my ways. I probably won't do anything there. If I was advising someone to buy new, I would, I would, I think I'd steer them towards if um, the Bosch, if you, especially for making large size pieces like this, if you're going to make a small size piece, almost any of these uh, hollowers will work. Like a like a five inch diameter vase, eight eight inches deep, any of these things will work fine. I think the Bosch has the capability to go a little bit deeper. Simon Hope is similar to the Bosch, is my understanding. The other thing is I sort of evolved. I mean, I've got all these tools and I used, I used four different shafts to, in the making of this piece or three different shafts, the Jameson uh, tool shaft um, and the two Stuart ones. If you had just two, if you had the two, uh, um, say if you had the Bosch system, you'd probably still need at least two, probably three. I would probably use the, a straight uh, boring bar, a, a swan neck one, and, and one bar that holds a, one of these teardrop scrapers. Mike, have you ever used one of Don Berry's hollowing tools? No. Um, there's that, is that the one with the, an outrigger bar or is that the one that sits between the two uh, like flat plates? It sits between two flat plates. It's kind of a yeah. D-shaped tool. Yeah, um, it, it's highly regarded. I think Pete, you might have that one, right? Yeah, that's the unit that I use. Yeah. People like it. The D-Way one, the D-Way tool has an outrigger bar that seems to be pretty popular or pretty strong. You know, again, for modest sized pieces, it works fine. If you want to make something this big, I don't think the D-Way or the Dairy will be uh, able to make something with this, this big of a diameter. Yeah, doing these more, um, the squattier pieces, the flying saucer shapes with the Dairy tool, it's, it's doable, but it is difficult. All right, you can see now I'm very close to the end of the travel there. But I'm still, what I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm in the um, a roughing stage where I'm pretty far away from the wall thickness. I don't have to really look at the camera or the laptop that much. I am, you see my body tilt as I try to see it just to make sure every now and then I'm tilting because the camera I'm using to record the video is in the way. See bigger, uh, bigger accumulation of shavings that have to, are being removed. All right. So this is the finished piece. It's take, I've taken it off the lathe, the, the, um, um, the um, I've unscrewed it from the, the face plate. But right here, there's a crack. This, this wall, the wall is, it, this might be, this color here might be a, the pith from the, the tree. I, I can't really remember, but you can see a knot here. It's full of cracks. This wall thickness is so thin that it cracked all the way from here to here. Of course, that won't stop me. That's just an opportunity to add some kind of filler, but it does make reversing the piece a little bit more difficult. You can actually move it with your finger by bending it. That hole is perfect, perfectly round, it hasn't changed shape. 
What I normally do at this point is I have a piece that fits into the, uh, like this, that fits into the chuck and it provides uh, support, not at the hole, but at a rim around the hole. So you get broad support of the piece as you're, as you're, you're using, you're gonna use tailstock pressure to hold this into the, into the um, hold this steady while you remove the foot. However, because it's so thin I'm, I'm, and cracked, I'm reluctant to use it. The other thing I would normally do for something that's this nice, I wouldn't want to screw it up, is I would take a, I would make a, a, a customized jam chuck that I would get the hole much closer to the uh, diameter of the hole, much closer to the diameter of the, of the piece, such that it's a relatively snug fit. That helps in centering it, making sure it's, it's perfectly centered. But again, I would put that on, on there and um, I would be machining this to get it to fit better and then get a broad support uh, for the friction, hole, ch friction chuck. However, in this case, because it's so thin, I'm gonna go with a third choice. And that is um, this one here. This diameter is, is uh, this diameter here is roughly the, matches the ID of the, of the piece of the hole, the entry hole, but it's a little bit, it allows a little bit of movement. This surface is concave a little bit so that it's, it's dished out if you, if you will. And I put a, I hot glued a little piece of uh, shelf liner on there. So that's gonna press on the bottom of the wood. You can't get better than that. You're not stressing any of the thin walls of the piece. All right. So the first thing I do is I make sure it's centered. Of course, this is sometimes problematic if you if you're cutting green wood. Okay, there you see the hole in the uh, the void in the material, the branch um, that was traveling through this piece of wood. Um, if the wood is green and it's dried now, uh, it might have warped to the point where you. you um, you can't necessarily decide how true it, it's it's acting. So, but I'm checking it at several places to decide if it's uh, if I've got the tailstock appropriate uh, um, positioned properly. And I look at it, I'm studying it, and I decide I'm not going to go with that uh, that tailstock um, insert. This is a Nova Live Center that I use, and it has the various pieces that go inside it. I'm knocking out that one. It has a point and I uh, and the point was not, I didn't want to rely on just a point. I wanted a, a cone supporting the piece. So you see the one on the left is what I had and the one on the right is what I'm going to use without the point. And so that, that's, I guess you'd call that a cup, cup center and that'll provide more uh, a steadier, uh, steadier hold. The other one, you risk the point bore, burrowing into the wood and becoming loose over time. So again, I'm checking the, the alignment. I decide uh, not too bad. So I'm tightening the tailstock. I try again. I, I feel that um, right about here, it's, that's, the high, that's the outer point. So I put that at the high point and I drop the, just the 32nd of an inch. I drop the, the thing and I check it again. I'm monitoring the gap between my finger and the wood. I decide it's pretty good. You can see that um, that rotted piece of void there is um, pretty significant size. All right, I got I went over and I got my um, face mask again, putting that on. Now I'm going to remove uh, this. I'm going to remove this entire thing to finish the bottom. Now, um, I start slow, but I do increase the RPMs up to where almost pretty much where I would be turning a bowl at this speed, you know, maybe 800, maybe 900. Be a little bit afraid to do 11 or 1200, especially with that big hole in it. Standard 5 8 bowl gouge, five inch diameter shaft. Now you've done almost all the hard work. 
you'd be uh, okay. I always stop frequently, check on the quality of the cut, check to see where what's happening with that void, seeing what's next. But at this point, it'd be there's no um, incentive to to take aggressive cutting and trying to remove this quickly. I mean, if, if you, I've broken pieces at this point, very, very uh, uh, frustrating. I usually use an overhand grip on my uh, bow gods and I'm shifting here to an underhand grip so I don't block the camera as much. Now you're probably aware that this here and this here, it's the same branch, you know, that was traveling through the wood at this, uh, in this orientation. And it's, and it's intersecting the surface of the wood in two different places. So in this one here, I had actually um, filled that with sawdust and coffee grounds and other things, about 80% filled to um, before I, before I had hollowed it actually from the outside, just to give it some stability during cutting. This one I left as it is because it was more difficult to access. It was blocked by the face, uh, face plate, et cetera. But they both look, both sides look like that. Now, you know that I like to do a lot of pieces with cracks in it and uh, voids, and therefore I don't use a vacuum chuck very much, very much at all. I have a vacuum chuck, I just don't, uh, I'm sort of um, dial, uh, can't use it on half my pieces, so I tend not to use it at all. But if, if you had a nice sound piece of wood, a vacuum chuck would work just as well. And in fact, even if you don't use the vacuum with, uh, with the vacuum chuck. The, the vacuum chuck is, is a nice round piece with foam on it that works well for, uh, for using uh, with tailstock pressure. Oops. Now this is actually cutting uphill or the wrong way. If you're cutting from on the outside of a piece, um, you usually go from the tail stock, from the small diameter outwards towards the bigger diameter. However, I've, uh, when I look at, the, at my cuts, I'm stopping it and I'm examining the cuts. I'm getting very little tear out, if any. So I'm very happy with this cut and I keep on doing that because it's, um, I'm able to uh, control the shape better. Now I'm going to uh, some shear scraping. Again, now the, the back handle is way down on my hip, more or less where my pockets are. Inspecting the cut, inspecting the shape. The void doesn't look as bad now, but it's still bad.
pretty smooth cut there, very fine. Um, then there's a tiny little bit of tear out right here. Sometimes I switch to a smaller diameter gouge at this point. And that's as far as I need to go. I mean, some, some, uh, they, some people call it being a hero, going down to just a nib, something like this. I don't want to take a chance, loosening the tailstock a little bit, see how little it takes to cut through this, the nub. And then I'll finish it up with a carving unit, a Dremel unit I'll take off, or a Ford, actually I have a Fordham, um, slightly more, you could remove that uh, remaining wood quite easily. Lots of different ways to remove that nub. Carving, uh, chisels. I don't like to use chisels. Just I've had a few cases where my wall thickness was so low that I, I caused cracking or something. But I carve that off with a rotary tool is my preferred way. All right, so this is the finished piece. It's uh, uh, sanded to 400 grit. Look at the chatoyants in there in the figure. It's amazing. I filled I uh, filled those holes with uh, mostly coffee grounds and CA glue. There's some shavings in there. That's finished with Osmo Poly X uh, gloss finish. Two coats, uh, and then um, touched up with buffing. So that's it. Beautiful piece, Mike. That came out really nice. Yeah, I'm very happy with that. Thing with that crack that we can see. Pardon me? Did you do anything with the crack? I can't see any filler. Or any yes, it's sealed. Yes. Um, let me go back to that. Whoops. Yeah, the crack went from here to here. Um, you can barely see it there. It's like a wiggle here. Like that. And there's sort of all sorts of cracks in here. Those are all sealed with CA glue and um, CA glue, coffee grounds, very fine sawdust. Did you color the inside to make it black or is it just a shade? It's just the shadows. Yeah. If you turn it around a little bit, you can see the inside, the maple color on the inside. Yeah. This almost looks like burl to me with these, uh, these uh, features, this figure in the wood, the curl of the figure. Yeah. Very nice, Mike. Yeah. Came out real nice. Came out really nice. <laughs> so, um, any other questions? No, thank you. Very nice demo. Well done. I'll show you what's more the th I'm, I'm replaying the video just a little bit to show the different angles of the piece. Very nice, Mike. Yeah, it looks real nice. excellent job, Mike. All right. Okay, Ron Tomas, you're going to put a bow on it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Are you going to put a bow on this meeting? Yeah, I'll get it right here. I just, hold on. All right, uh, Mike, I had a question. I had my hand up and uh, I didn't get uh, any response. Uh, can you hear me, Mike? Yes. Okay, you said that you uh, turn your 
like that hollow farm, for example, you turn it wet, green wood, is that correct? Yes. And do you turn that to a completed finished product? Almost always. If I was gonna make a cremation urn, I'd probably make it thick, thick walled and then twice turn it. But for these things, I let them warp a little bit. You rarely can tell. And if it does, it doesn't look unpleasing. Okay, uh, that, you answered my question. Okay, I, because uh, I do some hollowing, but I, I've been lately, uh, well, actually most of the time I rough turn it and let it dry, uh, but I'd like to try it, you know, to a completed form. You know, uh, it's just, it's like a philosophy. It's your preference. Like well, almost every bowl I make, every salad bowl, whatever, cereal bowls that I use, and I always turn them wet and let them, let them warp a little bit. And then I just, Maybe I touch up the base so that they sit flat. Maybe, you know, um, that's just the way I like them. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? No. Nope. Great job, Mike. Yeah, excellent yep. job, Mike. Uh, kept me awake, believe it or not, from beginning to end. <laughs> yeah. That is a testimony, I say. That's the test. Nice job, Mike. You made deep hollowing look interesting. Usually that's a super boring demo. Uh, you see somebody <laughs> stick a tool down a hole and that's all you see. Uh, this club You're 20 great. years ago, this club 20 years ago had uh, Frank Sadal on. And it was one of the first boring bars that ever came out. He had a taillight on the end of a uh, about an inch and a half steel bar that was Oh man, maybe eight feet long. You could hardly lift this damn this thing. And and uh, that was at the old rocker store, but uh, about a one eighth inch cutter in there. And he did these uh, vases about uh, six inches in diameter, probably 16 inches deep. But after you held that bar up in the air for a while, you got pretty strong. <laughs> a lot of improvements, nice job. Yeah, very good, Mike. I appreciate it.